define yourself? Will you impact the future? Will you lead the pack? Will you engage the world? Will you find the cure? Will you be the hope? So, will you? Come see how St. John's students are changing the world every day. Visit us today. How's it going, Soy? We are back with some more EGFC action. It's going to be St. John's University taking on Niagara. And, well, after that bit of a heavy hitter top dog match that, well, we had, well, maybe set up in the making, it's not going to be quite the same as it's looking more like not Niagara University is, well... It's going to be a little bit tougher. Yeah, no, <clears throat> excuse me. Absolutely. Uh, Niagara is this team that, uh, you know, the, the building blocks that we talk about time and time again uh, are really, you know, we look for them every single week because we've noted before, but this team is majority freshmen. They lost practically every starter they had from last season. And a lot of this team is new to really competitive scene or the competitive scene and competitive smash in general and so it's uh you know it, it's going through the growing pains right when you get into that you know first competitive scene you're going to be learning all you're going to be intaking a lot and going up against saint john's it, it's it's no easy task because saint john's is this team that is you know not quite championship tier, but they're close. They took down a lot of teams last season that felt like championship competitors. I mean, they were the ones who knocked down Siena, the defending EGF champs from season one. They took down Colorado in a, a in last season, and they're very close this season once again at three and two. They feel like they've got a, another championship caliber roster, but these are the games that you know, for St. John's, in order to give yourself a shot at that championship, you gotta blow teams like Niagara out of the water so that you can, you know, give yourself a good shot. You cannot play to their level. And as Playmaker is demonstrating, you gotta make the plays. You gotta go in there, get the hard reads, hard callouts on the jump as Redstone gets zero death. Yeah, uh, and obviously not the start you want if you're Red Saw, but Red Saw is one of these players for Niagara that's kind of been the bright spot of this roster. Got the first set win for the Purple Eagles last week, and really it's been so difficult. I mean, this is a matchup that is kind of a nightmare for Bowser. Yeah, as we graciously had our interviewee say last time, against the top, top tiers, Zero Suit, I uh, like Zero Suit Sanus, I'm in that camp. It can be brutal. And we can see Zero Suit is maybe one of the best whiff punishers in the game. Bowser, just by the nature of his character, is going to whiff a decent bit. And oh man, we can see, tries to call an air dodge or something right there. And that's going to get Playmaker off stage. And Red Cell trying to use the advantages of the character right as they come. But just the drop off forward air is going to be the finisher right there. I mean, definitely a kill percent right here. Any real good aerial at ledge could be the end point. But we saw the zero to death for a center stage the back air. Oh, well, horizontal stomp you straight off the blast zone. But I don't know if that's going to be much of a condolence when Playmaker is just in your head, in your face, not letting you breathe. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's just so difficult. And 
you can tell too, just Playmaker making great use of the character, just abusing the matchup, really. And for Red Saw, you have your one or two openings where you can get some damage, but it's just a matter of, can you track down this character? And right now, he cannot. And the side B right there, that's a really good disjoint to pressure the Playmaker. He didn't realize he had a second jump. I, I or, or did not have a second jump. I think he burned both and then thought he could jump back to stage and didn't have his upbeat. It's unfortunate. I won't lie. I feel like Playmaker can't let it get into their head though, because just because you can't find a way to finish off the Bowser doesn't mean they're gonna live forever. But at max rage right now, Red Cell, you can tell they're playing with a new renewed fire. And seeing that side B, they wanted it so bad, but there's no way any character who gets caught by that upbeat at 170 is a death sentence. Except maybe Shul, but you never know. <laughs> As that is going to be the finisher right there. Red Salt only dropping a single point. After how it opened up, not terrible, but I feel like Playmaker definitely just was a runaway train throughout the entire thing. It felt like a cutscene where your character is getting beat up, but Playmaker was the cutscene, and <laughs> if Red Saw was trying to mash buttons, trying to get out of the quick time event, and they just couldn't. They were not the one running the show. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And <clears throat> geez, even in uh, you know this type of matchup, you, you have your opportunities as Red Saw to, to find some hits. You saw he was able to get a little bit of damage, but Playmaker is in control of the pace of this matchup from start to finish because there's just, it, it's just so difficult for Bowser to catch on to this character. You've got the range, you've got all yeah. the combos on this big body. I mean, yeah. Soy. Okay. So it looks like Soy might be back, but either way, like like he was saying. Oh, my back. <laughs> it, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we're all good. We're all good. But yeah, you were saying okay. the disjoints, <laughs> the combos. And I feel like, again, I called it out the whiff punishes. Zero Suit can whiff punish with the side B and grab without really putting herself in that much danger. And Bowser's a fast character, the fastest heavyweight, but he can't really find the openings to get any punishes on those side Bs. You've just got to let it go. And when you have to let your opponent win neutral again and again and again because there's no way to punish them, maybe the character's good. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, it's not easy for Red Saw at all. And you have to wonder, too, if Red Saw is opting for a, a character change here. I know he's played Sora in the past. Uh, I think when the I think he played it the week that uh, Sora came out, but I'm not, I'm not sure if he has played it since. So I, I think it would be a, at least an easier time uh, going Sora in this specific matchup. Playmaker, uh, let's note that Playmaker for the side of St. John's is not a player who has seen a lot of action, but is currently 1-0. The, the times that he's gotten in, he's looked very strong. So this, this is a good kind of testing ground for Playmaker as well. Opting to ride out the Bowser is Red Sauce, so maybe he likes something in this matchup from game number one. I feel like, like you said, this is a matchup where St. John's, they ha they feel the need to really even out their point differential. Like, I, I, I want to be on Niagara's side as much as I can, as well. Red Saw is making a good argument for it, but if you have the ability and you're St. John's, you need to get the points on the board. You can't go 1-1. One, one. So the fact that Red Saw was able to make it that close means a lot. As Red Saw, this is not a terrible percentage to be at. But the question is, how do you get more than just trades when you're at such a high percent? Not going to get two frame. The jump off ledge is just going to be called out as Zero Suit, slippery as she is, just zips away. Yeah, and... Uh... Good forward air from Red Saw and okay. the forward tilt cleaning up that stock. You know, Red Saw has improved so much as a player. Oh my god, Red Saw! Come on, I'm trying to I'm trying to hype you up. 
you can be right some, but either way, yeah, after that unfortunate bit of uh, tech shenanigans, they do get the up smash. And Red Soul has improved so much at actually using every single aspect of Bowser's kit. We did see at times that Red Soul would kind of default to just using the specials, trying to beat out opponents at their own game. They've really come into their own as, uh, like, finding the F tilt two frames, finding the down tilt two frames, and, well, making plays. As Playmaker tries to fake him out with the double jump above, but they're not able to quite finish them off. And, Playmaker, because they weren't able to finish off Red Soul right away, it, it, it completely break their spirit. Maybe even playing with their food a little bit. And Red Soul has found their way back into this set in a big way. Ooh. Great awareness there from Playmaker, though. Uh, to go off stage, we talk about the ability to edge guard and just being able to clean up that stock is massive. Grab on shield. Second time we've seen jab on shield pressure work. The rare jab pressure may just be a thing, and that falling claw. Oh man, Soy. It's brutal. As well as that body slam as well. Tries to combo off of it, and that's going to get you in a world of hurt. 56% right now, but not terrible. Deficit for Bowser to be at. You just need that one opening. But Zero Suit is great at making sure you never get it. Oh! But down in the blast zone! I feel like they were trying to tech some. That might have been a buffer tech from years ago. But either way, it's going to hurt as Red Cell does get a point on the board. And now you could see the adaptations coming out in that set. So much more doable. I mean, Red Cell was at a lead for some significant portions. Yeah, no, absolutely. Red Cell had, you know, opportunities in that game and he was able to take advantage of them. And uh, as we get ready for game number three, I, I mean, this matchup still looks difficult, right? It's just a matter of, I think for Playmaker, you cut down on these SDs and you could still, you know, look like you did in game one and, you know, just be in control of this matchup. But this is, I think, the style that, that Red Saw has kind of adapted to, right? Where Bowser has these poor matchups where he can just, you know, be at a deficit or not have control of the pace of a matchup, but he can adapt. He can find ways in, he can find his openings, and Bowser's just raw damage output and kill potential can help him, you know, can carry him through a matchup, especially on the, you know, the one thing he does have in this matchup is the fact that ZSS is light. He can get a lot of early kills on this character, especially if he catches, you know, a, a jump by ledge on, on a, at a high percent. Things like forward air, back air, even an up smash or something along those lines. He can take early stocks with this character, and I think it plays to Red Saw's advantage. The problem is he's got to be able to hold on to his stock in the first place. Yeah, and that is tough. We can see the offstage play was really brutal. The amount of times they'd go for just a runoff forward air or that one time where they got a hard read with the spike. But they weren't getting that as much because it felt like because Red Saw was saving their jump, they had to respect the fact that a double jump aerial could put you in a tech situation you don't want to be in. So, both these players trying to clean up their play. The mutual SDs mean that none of them can truly claim that, oh, I only lost the SDs, but... Obviously, Playmaker's got to be feeling more after how dominant you started it all. Stuffing out Bowser immediately. This is how you do it. You use your superior buttons to make sure the character can't play the game. As the Zare safely pressures the shield. Red Salt. There's empty hops in the neutral. Gonna be called out eventually. Is the ledge grab away? I don't think they grab the ledge, but they missed time the downer. They're not gonna get the spike for it. Big opportunity missed on the side of Playmaker. And Red Saw, you can tell he's trying to play safer, but ooh, there's the opening. Can't quite get another follow up. Ooh, and off the top right there, I mean, not an unreasonable percent to be killed by the up B right there, as now the landing there is going to combo. But nice jump out of that, saving that. Going to give Red Soul another lease on life, but only 71% right now. That's not straight. A Bowser can take stocks of that percent, but it's not straight aerial percent. 
good grab again from Playmaker. Like the idea to try and read a roll in. If he does get it, that's a lot of damage and potentially the the stock. But able to you know, get back to stage here as Red Sox. Good forward tilt too, spaced well and able to catch Playmaker out. Yeah, Red Sol. That hard commit onto the side B right there. They want that at low percent so badly. And that's because so many of their other options just aren't safe on hit at low percent. And that's crazy to think as Bowser. But even when you hit the safe on hit move, you're still going to get punished. You're still going to get hit. Carried to the side of the blast zone and eliminated. Now, you're going to avoid the paralyzer. But is it enough? Can you find your way when you're down two stocks to one? We see Red Soul rely on these specials a lot towards when the beginning of the year and they were using the full uh breath of bowser's kit earlier in this set but now it feels like they're back onto the specials just trying to space forward airs too with the landing back here that's not gonna be safe and their jump is called out they don't have a double jump they knew it playmaker didn't go for the full commitment because that they are gonna get grabbed Another side B, not going to take the stock quite yet. And Red saw, I think first things first, you got to find a way to take this stock. Give yourself a shot on that next stock. But it will make it back to stage. That's another big grab. Forward throw instead. Gets a little bit of percent, a little bit of stage control. The stun in the side B. Clean it up and knock him down. Playmaker takes set one. Yeah. And they did it through cleaning up, sweeping up shop. Making sure that everything's all spick and span, shiny and clean for when the inspection was there. Because that is really what Bowser is. It's an inspection of how are your fundamentals doing? Are you getting caught by stray aerials? Have you ever found yourself being wiped out by just one air dodge off stage? Well, Playmaker was. Let's not, let's not mince me. They were finding themselves not the cleanest they could have been. But they tidied up, they uh, dusted, they waxed, everything was all shiny and new, and they were able to play safe, play non-committal, and play Zero Suit's game that Bowser is just not that fluent in. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we talked about it uh, already, but that, that matchup is just so tough for Bowser. But credit where credit's due to Red Saw to keep things close, minimize the damage. Only a four point differential here headed into set number two. And although Red Saw, you know, is kind of the, the rising star of this Niagara team, it, you know, it, it goes to show, I think, the, the growth of the these players. Because, you know, we saw week one, Niagara was, was swamped by Maris, right? They lost 30, uh to i think it was 30 to nothing was the final score of that game and we know how dominant you know maris has been in the past and st john's is of the same caliber right around that same ranking especially in terms of of point differential so for niagara you know to be able to keep pace here to at least get something on the board here it, it goes to show that the you know the building blocks are there it's just how long is it going to take for them to, to hit that next gear, hit that next level, take that next step? Yeah, and I I complimented uh, Red Soul for it, and I, I do want to highlight that because... Okay, I'm going to go out and say it. They were kind of bad when they opened up. I, I don't like to directly criticize, but there was one game where I clearly remember Red Soul only used specials. Up B out of shield, side B, and neutral B. And it was one of the longest games we ever casted. They have taken that and truly used... I, I mean, they've turned around in a huge way. They have actually gotten some amazing two frames. They're getting some good combos online. And they're making sure that you know the reason Bowser is so scary is because of his speed. Now... That fear factor wasn't able to net them a win this time, but Niagara definitely on the come up, as you said. Yeah, and uh, let's also give credit to Playmaker, too, for taking full advantage of, of that matchup, right? If you've got a winning matchup, you should be able to run away with it. And for Playmaker, he was in you know complete control. The only real major criticism i have of playmaker after watching that set is you got to be able to hold on to your stocks now that's all a lot harder against a heavy like bowser but 
in a format like this, where every stock is so important, to be able to play a little bit more defensive, to be able to maneuver around a bit more, you got to find a way to to hold on a little bit longer. And you know, it, five to one is a solid victory, but it's something that that I think the the depth of this roster in particular needs to work on. Yeah, as now, speaking of depth, we do actually have a Min Min player coming in. And shockingly enough, despite the domination of Min Min in online tournaments, I have not seen Min Min in EGF. I mean, I, I remember the first couple Wi-Fi events I ever casted, a Min Min made an upset in every single one. Like, Min Min was the talk of the town. But, I mean, people have just been opposed to playing her in EGFC, so I'm curious if Crisis is still on this character that they listed at the beginning of the season. Meanwhile, it is going to be, I think, Tendo uh, coming out from St. John's, is that right? Uh, it looks to be, and Tendo uh, made his first appearance last week. He was a Fox player for the side of St. John's. And although he did not get uh, the set win, you saw, again, kind of uh, glimpses of greatness. You saw what Tendo was going for. It was a lot of right idea, wrong execution. And uh, going up against Crisis, Crisis is, uh, I feel like, if he's got this Min Min in his pocket, that could be very interesting to watch. We saw Crisis back in week one go Ganondorf. And then I think in week two, he opted for Zelda. So... He might be in a bit of a character crisis himself, but I mean, it also uh, it is worth noting that you know when you when you have those multiple characters, you kind of get to play that that counter pick war. If you don't like a certain matchup, you have that ability to try and opt off it. And I mean, a lot of those people, especially at the college level with multiple characters, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's so if you. <laughs> No, 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 no problem. Uh, yeah, no, like you said, uh, just <laughs> between um, between Tendo's Fox and Crisis, whatever character Crisis opts for, uh, because we're we're not a hundred percent sure yet. Uh, Fox is one of those characters we also haven't seen a lot of Fox in the EGF. Now that I think about it, uh, outside of I believe it's LAX on uh, Sienna, who really has the only other fox i think in the egfc and blacks has had uh had, had a decent amount of success at sienna i mean sienna is one of those teams that is currently five and oh and uh so i think a little bit of pressure on tendo here here to to kind of make a name for himself and this is also the interesting uh portion for a team like saint john's that you know you're three and two you're looking to build that championship roster but as part of that college format, you don't know how long you're going to have some of these players for. A lot of these players, I think, are entering their their third uh, year of college, and so you've only got you've only got so long to kind of put your signature on a league like this. So, Tendo getting some experience here that's a that's a good sign for St. John's. Yeah, that is something a common thread we have heard from time. <laughs> the time um i mean investing in your growth as a league like we talk about these freshman players coming in and like sometimes they're not getting the big wins the huge point differentials but just giving them that experience is so crucial is i am excited to see more of tendo coming in as yeah okay so I am curious, we did see the Fox, like you said, against Ganon, online I feel like Fox could maybe struggle a tiny bit, I mean on paper should destroy him, and it's a Lucina, let's go! Wait, <laughs> hold on, wait, that's Tendo with the Lucina? I saw the, I saw the wolf and I thought it was a skinned Fox for a second, no, that is Crisis, okay, so complete character mix-ups, we have no idea what we're talking about, um, 
regular old top tier showdown. Okay, not a pleasure we get to see that often, but I feel like this is a tale of extreme wolf. It's actually one of the characters that can contest Lucina on the ground, but Lucina can definitely scrap with the best of them due to those disjoints that don't care about spacing whatsoever. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, off to a little bit of an early lead is Tendo, but there it is. There's the laser. I feel like that's going to be a huge aspect of this matchup because that laser just does so much damage. And it's something Tendo doesn't have a very clean answer to. It's something Sorties typically have some struggles against, but playing around the ledge here and now giving up some stage, but he is able to find that grab. Down smash, not quite the right spacing on it. Love the idea from Crisis though. And I love the no-nonsense lasers. You could theoretically get a bigger punish when you see that shield breaker come out, when you see a smash attack come out, or you could just smack him with a laser. I mean, it gets the message across, it gets you some good percent, and well, right now, this is pretty much kill percent for both of them, and that's an unteckable. No tech to Jesus this time. And there's going to be, well, sitting pretty at 152%, but with that Dancing Blade sending them off and the jump caught, that was an opportunity there. Didn't get the two frame there. Yeah, dangerous opportunity there for Tendo. Couldn't quite seal it away, but this is something that Crisis, this is an area for him that... We're, we're looking to see some growth in. There we go. Is able to seal that stock away. Luciana nearly living up to 200%. Crisis's ability to take stocks is something we're, we're really looking for because he finds a way to get damage on the board. But like we, well, like we said, this is a format where every stock matters and Crisis has not been able to take stocks very cleanly. So good first stock off the board, but can he find a way here to get a comeback on the second stock? <laughs> no mashers? No mashers in chat? Okay. I mean, Crisis? Okay, my friend does that to me all the time because I always... I don't mash, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm not a masher either. But Crisis, that is such a strong message when you get grabbed and you just get knocked around. You get smacked. I mean, that was a full combo right there with the amount of pummels they got in. Yeah, a absolutely. A a and... On top of that, too, it's kind of a... It almost acts as a mind game, right? Because now now you're thinking, okay, they're going to force me to mash because I just don't want to eat all of that percent again next time. And that's, of course, the when they decide, all right, I'm going to go for the early throw. Yeah, and then... Well, it's not unreactable, but you can be caught out throwing out some wacky options if you do mash out. I, I'm always team masher, but either way... Crisis is really struggling here. The disjoints have been a little too much, and, well, that, that recovery a little too disjointed from the ledge. Isn't quite able to snap to it while turned around like that, and it will be them eventually taking it home. As, uh, they're able to get the finisher. Yeah, uh, again, this is more of kind of what we've seen from the past uh, of that that right idea, wrong execution, right? Like, it's a good idea for... Uh, it, it, it's a good idea for... Uh, <laughs> excuse me. It's a good idea for Crisis to go for that back air, right? To get back to stage, to, you know, use... Uh, uh, you know, throw out some sort of move to threaten the ledge so that you can't get ledge trapped. But on the other hand, you know, you got to know that that back air is not going to leave you the time to up the back to stage. The end lag of that move is just too long. And you got to know that on a character like Wolf, where your recovery options are a little bit more limited. They don't they don't cover as much as the other spaces like Fox or Falco. Yeah, and you really do make up for that with one of the best ground games in the game, whether it be through access to amazing short hop aerials or just some of the best tilts in the game. I mean, forward tilt, it's the all-purpose multi-tool right there. You need a two-frame. I got you. You need to catch a roll. I got you. You need to catch a jump, a get-up attack. 
Neutral get up is throw out the claws. It's all you really need to do. But <sighs> they're not all disjointed. Not all of those uh, tilts. And so if you're not in their face, if you're not stuffing them out before they can even throw out an option, then those tilts kind of become a little more mediocre. Still some of the best in the game. Just you've got to force them. At this level, not a lot of people are going to mess up their spacing just because of it. You have to force them to mess up their spacing. And we'll see how Crisis can try and make that happen going into the second round. Yeah, going into game number two here, opting for Kalos, and I like this. Uh, I, I mean, in terms of Crisis being able to take stocks, the, the way I see Wolf taking a lot of stocks with that forward tilt, things like forward smash even, you're going to get more kills, I think, off the side than off the top, so I, I really do like the stage pick here. And... Tilts in opposite directions. You got to love to see... Crisis, I feel like, is just a Well, I was in the, in the middle of saying accidentally, is that is unfortunate. But either way, now Crisis, playing for in the deficit, Nintendo knows it. They're not going to let it drop, as they just beat out these landing aerials with grabs, catching the landing lag. This is textbook right there. With no landing options, no mix-ups, this is the deficit of the uh, Kalos counterpick. Yeah, and like you said, taking full advantage of a good air dodge behind to get out of that uh, disadvantage scenario. And the side may be trading there. Kind of an awkward trade at that, but one that will go into those favor as he lands that forward smash. Man. Oh, going on to let stage right there. It was a very... I, seeing them dash dancing, I don't blame them for it, but it's still very risky. Is now at 146%. You're going to be finished off. Tend to on course for a three stock. But Crisis ain't going to let that happen. They get the jab. They got the tech chase situation going, but they actually jump out of it. And the side B is such a good lingering get off me tool. And, and I love this. They're not... Oh, no. I think that was a result of the mash, maybe. I'm not sure. Either that or it was a turnaround laser that just went so, so wrong. But either way, it's going to be the three stock for Tendo. As St. John's University, after it was looking a little bit close for a moment, a brief moment, the tiniest of seconds. They have ran away. They've ran far away. They're over the horizon. Yeah. No, absolutely. Tendo with a, a solid showing there. And, uh, you know, it, it's like we said, Crisis is one of the, those players for Niagara that, you know, we, we're, we're still looking to see how he builds off of, you know, the building blocks from week one, week two. And when you're constantly kind of switching characters, it, it, it changes the dynamic of, of how you learn. And so I feel like really the, the key difference here. Tendo had a game plan coming in. He kept it simple, right? Lucina is just, all right, I'm going to wall you out with my sword. I'm going to get those those strong hitboxes. And, you know, I, I, I'm just going to win neutral. I'm going to find a way around that, that laser. And it feels like the game plan and the adaptation for Crisis were just kind of all over the board. You had, you know, the opportunity to mash in game one and didn't. And then here it ends up possibly biting you for, for a loss. You use the laser a lot in game number one, but in game number two, you tried to go in for a bit, a few more hits, trying to find that stock and it just doesn't work. It's the, it's the, the little things. I, I often, this is another portion of what I call, you know, right idea, wrong execution. Yes, now. I'm sorry, Jenny Exe. I really am. But that may be the last time we get to say your name. As Mr. L is coming in here. And if you are new to the EGFC, let me give Mr. L a bit of an introduction. Mr. L is the player literally every team is scared of. Literally every team's goal is to just minimize the amount of points Mr. L can get. And some teams actually do beat him out. I think Katsuji got a win on Mr. L the other week. And to be honest, 
this this is our little secret our little secret mr l hasn't been looking as dominant as rumor would have you believe but rest assured they're still a very good player and i think it's sort of just getting reused to online so we'll get to see how that sort of pans out but i i don't know based on how the other matchups have been going i can't imagine mr l is going to drop this sorry jenny <laughs> yeah mr L is definitely one of the heavy hitters uh, of this team. And, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is, like you said, Mr. L has not necessarily been a, as dominant as he has in the past, but his record is still very clean. I mean, aside from the one hiccup in Katsuji, he's been he, he's been winning the rest of, uh, of his sets. It just hasn't been, you know, what we're used to seeing of those, you know, those three stock victories, the those huge performances where he gets the lar the large combo, he lands the thunder spike, things like that. Mr. L can be kind of flashy at times, but it's that type of, you know, highlight reel material that we we haven't seen in the past. And I'm curious to see how that will manifest here. Jenny Xy, like I said. The name of the game, name of the game 100% is trying to, uh, well, minimize the amount of mileage that Mr. L can get, as I think that is Jenny EXE on the Sora right here. Is this yet another DLC character that Pikachu will have a winning matchup against? Yes. But, it's still not going to be easy for the little guy as you're going to be able to get the grab right there. Instant follow-up, controlling the ground game, like I said, trying to land with those down airs, and the more you do that laggy option, the more Mr. L is going to catch on to you. As a little bit of poking right there. Mr. L off stage, but they're not going to be caught by the down air, and now they have you off stage. Going to be going deep, but Sora is, if he pulls his button a little too early, very hard to edge guard. I mean, it's a big old hitbox around that little twister. Yeah, absolutely. And Jenny right now doing a decent job of keeping it close so far as Mr. L just finding a lot of chip damage here and there. Went for a read, but could not find it. At forward, they're going to push Jenny off stage once again. And I like the landing down there, but it will be punished by the up smash of Mr. L. Yeah, that downer is great off stage against a lot of characters, but it's not always the best. As blocking that thunder, Pikachu's like, no, 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 no. You think you're going to hit me with thunder? You got another thing coming, my friend. You're going all the way down until you are too. Okay. The reversal with the upbeat right there. And Crush is still, or er, Jenny EXE still makes it back. Yeah, Mr. L dipping a little bit too low, and Jenny able to land the up B. Not sure Mr. L was really ready for a, a, such a quick up B, and will fall prey to that that stock. But the other thing you'll note, too, as the set goes on, I believe Jenny is, is one of those players that loves to go with aggressive options, and Mr. L calling them out on it. Yeah, and those call-outs are exactly what I'm looking to see is down throw immediately, but drag down with the Nair, continuing the combo, 30% already, but that Thunder Spike, they're trying to read a hard jump up, that's not going to happen, as they cover all the options on the platform with that down air, could have drifted either way, the counter not going to come out as you would have liked, but for the part, for the most part right now, Crisis is able to hold on Jenny EXC though. Actually dashes right underneath the Thunder Jewel. I didn't know if the Sora was that small. But either way. Mr. L is actually caught by the up smash. Last stock right now. Mr. L is just trying to wait for the options. But a little too preemptive on pulling the trigger on a lot of these punishes. An opportunity perhaps. But Sora so light. Dragged down at the end of the stage in the death sentence. As Mr. Ed does clean that off with only a single stop. Yeah, and that was the goal for Jenny, right? You just got to keep it close. Just got to give yourself a shot in that set and, you know, gave themselves a shot. But Mr. L, again, too clean, right? Knows those combos well. 
And uh, I think really the difference maker was that, that Jenny, you know, uh, you, you take that first stock, you get a little bit of momentum on your hands, but I feel like Jenny is starting to run out of defensive options, right? Because they're put off stage so many times and you can tell Mr. L, he wants that, that clip, right? He wants to get all the string, all those hits together into that thunder, but Jenny's doing a very good job of getting out of it. Think of think of that that very last stock, right? Gets the gets the the up air, uh, gets the I think it was Nair to up air from uh, the wall jump off, off stage. Each gets them off stage and then goes for the thunder spike. And Jenny is just out of there. Side B, all three of them quickly get out of dodge, just reset the scenario. And it's something like that that Mr. L will will take note of. But it's important to note because Jenny. Is typically one to land with aggressive options. This is now her start, uh, really starting to play around with these more passive options. Just get out, reset the scenario, and it's a good sign of growth from them. Yeah, it definitely is. As they're able to clutch out for the most part, but now the download is here. Jenny XC got a good chance to look at Mr. L's habits on how they punish their landings. Mr. L was definitely paying attention. Let's see if Jenny was as the test comes up now. Landing down air, not punished. Changing up the timing just a little bit. But that thunder leaves an opportunity to get in. The nair loop's coming out? No, not quite true this time. I like the idea there to land that down air and then try and continue the combo, but Jenny able to get out of it once again. Ooh, another forward smash. Jenny swinging for the fences here, and so far, getting a little bit of damage on board. Ooh, the dash tag not going to connect to drag down there, not going to hit either. Mr. L. At the moment, a little bit trouble landing, but. They're able to get back scot free eventually. As the Thundaga is online, we've seen Jenny EXE get punished for this before. Will they come out again? Hey. Weird kind of angle there from the from the side B, but it was able to I think kind of trip up Mr. L. That's it's not safe though. That side B will get punished, and that'll be the first stock off the board. Oh, hard callouts right there all around as they're getting the... Ooh, trying to go for the nair loops right there, but jumping a little high above. He's going to... Oh, that hurts. No, don't do it. Okay. <laughs> I was like, Mr. L, think of the points. But no homie stock this time as the up B is not going to be into a side B. And you can see Mr. L was actually clearly expecting that. So a nice little mix up from Jenny EXE, but either way... Not even stocks, or not even stocks, uneven completely. You can see Mr. L is happy to just kind of play the lead, punishing these attempts at counters and whatnot pretty hard right now. So eventually that weight is going to be punished with the down air. Yeah, and now Jenny at 170, trying to find a way back into this match. Let's find a good back air. But I think one of the struggles right now is that Mr. L is just making themselves very hard to track down. Think, think similar to like ZSS, right? It, sometimes all those jumps, all that movement is just really hard to track down, but will end up finding that forward smash. So once again, last stock scenario. Yeah, but do you see that back air beat out the down air? Mr. L's having none of that. Down smash at ledge, is that going to be the finisher again? No. Even the floatiest of floaties still have another chance. Up air, pretty safe on shield. They're able to survive for the second, but not that. Forward smash dropping down. It began with a down air, it ended with a down air. The punish was there, and even though Mr. L gets the win, making them get the minimum amount of points you can, that is one of the best performances you can ask for going up against Mr. L. So good on Gen Jenny EXE for pulling that together against one of the most feared players in the entire league. Now, it's done and it's done and dusted. Let's be real. You would need 
the perfect game, the perfect perfect game, in order to pull out a win here. It's not impossible, but I think it's about to be. As we have seen some incredibly, like, if you remember some of the other players coming up, like Aloma Mola, for example, going up against uh, AIV, I believe, uh, the Ike player, they were faced with the task of um, the task of trying to stop the point differential. And though they did fail, they still did get the set win. Like they're a very clutch player. It's not quite clutch enough. And it's actually going to be EJJ first. Yeah, uh, EJJ, one of the new faces to this roster that I think they put a lot of emphasis on him. And I say that time and time again, because EJJ is one of those players that uh, has really stepped up in the in this league, two and three on the season. But we didn't see him last year, so he's a new player on this roster. And he's also, you know, one of those uh, types of players that He's got multiple characters in his kit. Mostly we've seen Diddy Kong, but a week ago we saw him switch to Rob when he needed it and it worked out very well. And he's also one of these players that's typically going in these high priority slots. You know, the third set of the match, the fifth set, the second set when they they're, when they're trying to think uh trying to bring things back to even. So they have a lot of faith I think at St. John's in EJJ and how he plays. And, well, I've got a perfectly valid reason to. And coming up is Crispy, I believe. Um, I can't quite recall. Was Crispy one of the uh, Corn players? Many Corn players right here. But I, I think I am misremembering. Either way, uh, it's... I have... It, crispy down as uh as a uh, uh, he's another one of those players that's kind of switched off characters uh but it's mostly the the terry incineroar uh i believe a week ago we saw crom on him but uh those are the three that i have i've marked down this uh so far this season thank you soy the master of data <laughs> listen there are a lot of players 40 players a day every week there's a lot of people. There are a lot of you. But listen, I am a kind and capricious caster. As you see, it doesn't even matter who they're playing because it they're not going to be. It's the Sora. It's the Sora from Crispy. As EJJ sticks firm and true on the monkey. As you can see, their tag suggests. And at, once he saw that trip right there, I thought it was a guaranteed punish, but nice immediate roll from Crispy to avoid the punish. But, well, you can see the whiff punishes when you're on the ground are brutal from Giddy Kong. You can't just be throwing out tilts like that or you're going to get a uh, minimum 30%. Love the follow-ups too from EJJ, and I think he might have dipped a little bit too low. No, he is able to make it back. Uh, Sora's recovery, you know, incredible in terms of distance. Yeah, as well, immediate parry on the uppy. That's again, it's just a read. And the fact that Diddy Kong can crawl too, micro positioning in this game not a benefit many people are given at least if you don't walk which let's be honest these boots ain't made for walking but diddy kong's barefoot so it's fine as that's the banana up smash right there ejj on the hot track for a three stock they want to end this and they want to end this quickly the double trip from a single banana bouncing all over the place and you can see the tricky movement in the air is making it so hard for Crispy to figure out where is safe for them. It's certainly not the ground. Even that one combo, 53. Oh, what did the Z drop? Oh, he got it too. He just misspaced that down air and uh, could not seal away the stock. But that banana trip will do it into the forward smash and EJJ wrapping this first game up in style three stock on the board this is what i was expecting all day if i'm going to be honest and the fact that it hasn't looked like this all day is proof that 
even the quote bottom of the barrel uh can still put up a huge fight until you run into ejj well ejj i i feel like diddy kong is one of those player characters who punishes you so hard for mistakes i I would have said the same of ZSS too, but I feel like Diddy Kong in particular is a little less execution heavy than ZSS in the fact that if you whiff, you're going to eat the banana, you're going to eat percent. If you whiff, you're going to eat banana, you're going to, uh, well, go up in percent. And the potassium, it starts to add up and you're not supposed to eat more than four bananas a day. Do you know that story? <laughs> no, I did, I did not. <laughs> and well, as you can see, has some terrible health effects, like three stocks, all the while. The, the double banana in particular, that hurt a lot. And it's little side effects like that that really make Diddy Kong a force to be reckoned with. But they're not that deadly if they're not in the right hands. EJJ, they got the opposable thumbs. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. EJJ is one of these players that, again, they put a lot of faith in him in this roster, and and I think he knows it too. So there's a lot of pressure on, on him, to, you know, especially against a, a team like Niagara who's been struggling this season. EJJ is kind of supposed to be on this roster the the point getter. He is the supposed to be kind of the the hidden boss of st john's because if he's going to st john's is this team like there there's expectations on them to be that championship team to compete with teams like depaul mississippi state you know colorado there's expectations on them to be able to to keep pace with them and if ejj is going to be that that secret you know boss of st john's then he has to be able to put up these numbers against the Niagara, against the struggling team. He has to be able to get these three stocks. Yeah, and that really is the sign of true greatness. I mean, Mr. L might have higher peaks, but having that baseline is so important. It's in real tournaments, it's how you avoid getting upset in pools throughout bracket. Your autopilot needs to be on par with other people's peaks. And that is where EJJ rests. I don't know where EJJ's peaks lie. I have a feeling we haven't seen them completely yet. But for the most part, they're happy to just clean up shop when they get the chance. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. And, and uh, it, it's one of those things too for, for Niagara, right? You have those kind of, uh, you have moments like this where, you know, the ride is not going to be easy. You're going to be going up against you know a a high tier opponent you know a, a team that has a lot of depth a lot of experience i mean we talk about you know how good mr l has been jay grunt is still you know waiting in the wings of this roster and jay grunt has been perfect so far this season four and oh when he has played and you know to and they you know between mr l and jay grunt they can kind of share that experience down the line whereas niagara they don't have that kind of resource available. They don't have the experience. These are all rookies, all freshmen. And to have a team of all rookies, it's kind of unprecedented. Even in traditional sports, typically you've got someone. But, you know, this, this is really from the ground up with Niagara this season. Yeah, and I mean, they've proven they're able to make something out of nothing. But, uh, well... Yeah, just, uh, I wouldn't exactly call what they had nothing. They all brought their own unique skill sets to the table. But I feel like this is a good demonstration of one of the most common Smash Bros. tournament experiences out there, so of being the best in your friend group, and then coming out and go into your first competition whether it be an online college thing or your first local and then you meet all the other people who are the best of everyone they know and their best is a little bit higher unless you're some freak of nature so i i have a feeling this is kind of a wake-up call for a lot of these best of their friend groups coming in joining the niagara team and when you meet 
those uh, those next level people. You either go all the way up or you go all the way down as interesting. Three, two, one, We're going to be having the King K rule coming in against the Rob. Terrifying. But hey, it, our producer is very happy because as you know, that down tilt is not completely safe on hit at zero, especially against a super heavy weight. And using the jab to get through it, very good for Crispy. Good awareness. You're gonna need more than that though as a defense climb higher. No mash right there. You know EJJ is going to be noting that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, we actually saw this Rob a week ago for EJJ. So I, I like the idea here, get some more experience on this character because it looked very clean. And right there, earning that up smash off of the punished dash, dash attack from Crispy. So able to take that first stock. And just going for the landing there right there to send them out behind. Gonna be caught by the last hit of the up there, but you're still gonna contest with those meaty K rule hitboxes with, well, some of your own as hit throw right there. Not quite enough. As EJJ is just being so controlling. I, I mean, it makes sense as a controller themselves, but it has felt so hard for Crispy to get anything done, but K Rule doesn't exactly have the space taking pulls and being caught by the downside on platform right there. That's going to set you up for a world of hurt. You're off stage, and is this going to be another three stock? On ledge is where it gets all the side at the board smash. Not going to kill Rob quite yet, but that cannonball going high means there's no sort of ledge trapping. Tries to go for the finisher with the laser, but it's not going to connect. That spike, though, will be it. The afterburn sending them straight down into the depths. Crispy. Eight points on the board. If St. John's wasn't winning then, they are winning now. As this is the kind of point differential we were expecting. Yeah, no, absolutely. Solid showing from EJJ. Uh, and, and this was, you know, the uh, air quotes here expected result because EJJ is one of those players that, I mean, time and time again, he is expected to Put up these types of numbers i do like what i see from him in terms of the ability to kind of switch between these two characters and have a lot of success because we've seen you know i, I think he prefer we'll have to ask him if we get the chance to to interview him if he prefers diddy kong or rob because the diddy kong has been shut down at times but when this rob has made its its few appearances it has looked very very clean yeah, I, I, I remember. I, I don't, I don't want to be rude about the uh, Nintendo Online, but I remember they had said they had St. John specifically has prepared lag characters for when they're playing teams across the country, and so I think that is why they practice the Rob because that is their lag character. If I remember correctly, Thitko's is Jigglypuff, which I thought was really funny when it happened. But, like, it shows St. John's came to this format understanding completely. It's what, it's the experience that a veteran of the scene brings. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and for Niagara, uh, on the flip side of this, again, it's kind of back to the drawing board here. And Crispy, it feels like, was kind of thrown to the wolves, but you know you can't blame him for the effort that he put out and again it feels like you know a lot of kind of right idea wrong execution once again where you were able to find these stray hits you're able to get back to stage uh you know avoiding you know the laser or the gyro you're able to avoid those projectiles but you got to play a little bit smarter right you got to throw out something like crown to make them respect that that distance you can't give them the time to just set up that that down air because you know that down air is coming especially when it's you know basically going down the checklist for rob on that on that edge guard and even in on stage things you know, right like dash attacking a shield is almost never safe and it got punished for it at least once or twice as the Loma Mola pulling out the Enderman right here, this is confusing. But going up against Poshi Koopa, the DK, I cannot blame them for that, as they immediately just get the Iron Tools online and Sky Basing? 
and they're trying to go for the mix-up with the anvil right there. But that was just a lot of resources all for nothing. Moshi Koopa had the awareness to understand what is safe, what isn't. And punching the blocks right there, getting yourself stuck in hit lag, that ain't safe. Yeah, this is not uh, a typical character for Alomomola, but Boshikupa's DK is something we've seen time and time again, and it's been also pretty good for this roster. Despite not finding set wins, it's mitigated a lot of damage from a lot of uh, anchors in rosters, and Alomomola barely able to snap to ledge there. I feel like this is still a, a struggling matchup for Boshi Koopa with what Steve can do. Finding the kill becomes all the more important, but the good mash right there from Momola to make sure it's not going to come out. Boshi Koopa now off stage. Oh, you see that drift on that upbeat to avoid the anvil? They're going to be killed by the Ford Air regardless, but still, very nice stuff as Boshi Koopa finds themselves in the middle of a bunch of houses, but. They're able to escape just fine. Jailbreak. As now that pickaxe is gone. Well, Momola has got to do some updating soon enough. But for the moment, Goshi Koopa eating a lot of damage, even though they haven't really gotten the opportunity to build yet. Is Momola just going to lose all of their tools? It's possible. Goshi Koopa doing a good job of staying alive on this stock. But you can tell, I think, a little bit. Boji Koopa's kind of tunnel, tunnel visioning on how he wants to find this stock, find a way to take this first stock off the board of Alomomola. And Alomomola is, is just ready for every every kind of quick answer he has. And you can see Alomomola cannot actually mine. Cannot actually... Crap, yeah, they have broken all their tools. That's what Alomomola is going for. They're, they're going for the hitless run. And by hitless, I mean... No hits from weapons, I guess, as, well, they try to go for the up throw, not going to find it. This is, I've never seen a Steve do it, and that's why, because it's terrible. But now that they're on their second stock, they're able to get diamond tools online. I expect this might be a quick one after this, but the giant punch, Boshi Koopa begs to differ. One big combo right here, and we could be seeing a ding dong off the top. Yeah, and you had to have known, too, the second that neutral B is charged, that that move's coming oh. out. That down tilt, that's going to kill relatively soon. I actually like the idea to early up B, but Alomomola ready for it and cleans up the second stock. Yeah, it's the next step in adaptation. I mean, what else would you do? As Alomomola gets the clean build up, but they give themselves a nice little wall to bounce off of right there, so not too much trouble. Boshi Koopa trying to space these back airs. If they do get a kill right here, it's going to be even, even though it does not feel like it, it should be. But that is the power of playing a heavy. You lose, you lose, and lose until you win. And just like that, there's the strong hitbox. That grounded up the so good. Has a little bit of armor to it and is able to take the stock. The neutral be missed, though. What in the world? How, did that do... Did that hit? Did he take percent and not go anywhere because of it? I think he did. That is the power. DLC. There's the lava <laughs> block. Falls down. Roshi Koopa now. 137, max rage. It's important, but at the ledge, you cannot survive that. Alomomola gets stock up on their secondary. Roshi Koopa does have other heavies up their sleeve. They've got the Bowser, they got the Ridley, but I feel like this DK is their home, and why would you mix it up at this point? Yeah, uh, I, I agree. I think I think this I think his DK is probably the most practiced. Uh, it looks the cleanest, I think, among the the heavy characters uh, at his disposal. The problem is that just heavy characters against Steve is just such a, a tough matchup because you have all the combos in the world with with, uh, with Steve. On the other hand, Boshi Koopa was able to find some openings, and I think that's one of his strengths, right? He plays the full heavy type of game where the hits he gets are massive. If he finds you know those one, two, three hits, he can find a way to take stocks but he's going to eat a lot of damage doing that. And I think he fully leans into that play style. So 
if he can just, you know, find a way to to play a little bit safer and look for those big hits, like for example, the uh, the fully charged neutral B, right? You know that he's landed with that twice now to try and get some damage on the board. And it's it's good to get that damage on the board. But if he can hold that in his pocket, you know, just a little bit longer and maybe use that as a kill move, like he did the uh, the grounded up B, then it might, you know, work out a little bit better in the long run for him. Yeah, I definitely agree right there. I, I feel like Boshikupa definitely had... Well, they were doing the safe thing. Capitalize the safe thing. Because they would jump and land with a fast fall back air. Fast fall back air, fast fall back air. And it was safe, as heavy can be. But you're still going to get whiff punished like that. Steve's got disjoints. You don't care about your monkey feet. So, I, I do feel like, especially when you're playing against a more uh, neutral base Steve, like a Loma Mola, who doesn't really have the combos down pat, but they're still going to wreck you with just pure neutral wins using Steve's tools. You can't just rely on doing the safe thing all the time. And we did see some risks come out with the giant punch with the forward airs, but still, it's going to be tough. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I'm curious to see if Olomomola continues to ride out this uh, this Steve or not. Because again, this is one of his, I think, less practiced characters. We typically see uh, a Joker or Pikachu, I, I believe, from from uh, Olomomola in general. I think it's actually exclusively uh, Joker for the most part. He's 3-1 and one on the season when he plays Joker. So to see him opt for you know a diff a, a very different style of DLC character, it, it, it's been interesting to watch. And like you said, he, although he went toolless for the the first couple stocks there, I think in general, it, it's like you said, he's winning a lot of the neutral game, and he's just earning a lot of mileage off of that. Yeah, and I feel like Aloma Mola did get a little cheeky at times, going for the tool list run unarmed combat is not exactly steve's forte as going up against gorilla i mean I, I, an un, unarmed combatant against any large ape is never going to end well and you can quote me on that so I, as oh we went right into it but it's not an ape this time it is the la crocodile King K rule here for game number two, and we haven't seen Boshi Koopa's King K rule so far this season, and gonna eat that down air. Great job by Aloma Mola, recognizing the spacing of that move, saying, hey, this will cover just about any low recovery, and Boshi Koopa not quite ready for the tech, so first stock off the board. And that's something you're probably only gonna get once, but it's still enough. As Steve, I mean, does have the tools right here. Squirming through that minecart right there as... Oh, they go up the jump, but the instant air dodge because they have understood the mistake they had made. The TNT about to blow up on lead as... This is a minefield that Aloma Mola had not set up last time, but that is one of Steve's fortes. Oh! The trade? Okay. But Aloma Mola scrapes out. Or crisis, rather. Boshi Koopa able to survive that trade, but he will lose his stock to another down air. So stock number two off the board and Olova Mola just going to buy some time, collect a few more materials and start to chip away at this big crocodile. Nice. Oh man, 42% immediately. Able to survive for now, but... Yeah, these anvils raining high. It forces you to avoid snapping right to ledge. And once the Loma Mola is able to figure out the optimal punish that it's game over, they went all the way down for the stage spike again, but they're going to survive. Oh, the ping pong. That's, I love seeing ping pong combos right there. I don't know why I said it like that, but listen, I get excited when I see things happen on the screen. What gave me this career? <laughs> Ooh. Oh, and it happens again. 
dropping right through the block sandbill. It's going to be the finisher right there, the last move of the game. St. John's University finishes their almost sweep against Niagara with Doshi Koopa not even able to get a point. Yeah, uh, and again, I think it just more or less came down to, you know, uh, Boshi Koopa, it was right ideas and, and finding openings, leaning into that heavy play style. But at the end of the day, Loma Mola, his neutral game was, was just, it was just better at the end of the day. He was able to get so much mileage off of every interaction. And Boshi Koopa had, again, opportunities think i actually you know like you said the ping pong play if he i think just continues that for a little bit longer if he throws out another nair or or two maybe another or maybe two even you know maybe a little more attacks it but even if he doesn't that forward smash is still a little risky because he might get sent right back into the block again and it just feels like boshi koopa leaned almost too much into that heavy play style just wants that that heavy hit wants that that stock because that's what they can do but if you, you've got to be able to play a little bit more patient hold back a, a little bit and uh keep those kill moves in your pocket it's something that I, I think a lot of top players have that ability to just you know keep that info in the back of your mind and then pull the trigger on those big plays late in matches it's something that I think Boshi Koopa could really benefit from. Yeah, but ultimately they weren't quite able to. So that's going to be a wrap on Niagara University, but not quite on St. John's as we are going to get an interview with Playmaker actually coming in. That ZS says from the game one. So we can ask them about their debut in EGF and how they're feeling moving through this season on such a dominant team. So don't go anywhere. EGFC will be back with an interview in just a few minutes.
Welcome back, everybody, to EGFC. We are here with Playmaker, who is making plays for St. John's in their win. How you doing, Playmaker? I'm doing all right. Thanks for having me, guys. How are you all doing? Hey, we're doing fantastic after that win, and you kind of started off really strong. I mean, Red Cell did kind of make it close a little bit, but I, I, I do feel like you definitely had the edge a lot of the time. So, like, what was your... Uh, mentality in being like the starter for st john's uh usually the mentality that we try to have with our starters is just to set the momentum for the rest of our players so let's just say if someone started it we'd have logically someone to continue and, and keep it going and to hopefully like build it up to like you know like this really strong point where we're playing at our best and we're playing super well keeping the lead and everything so that's sort of what i wanted to do i wanted to sort of set that pace so that everyone else just knew you know where they wanted to go with the rest of it yeah yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and now this victory for you guys, uh, this propels you to four and two. And with this massive uh, point differential, this will really help with your, your tiebreaker statistics. How are you guys feeling about how you, you've performed in this season so far? I think it was kind of a... a slower and like you know like less desirable start for us for sure but i think we're finally getting our footing into the egf you know like we, we got back into online we've even attended some offline locals recently and you know like we're all just like even more pumped to get better so i i think if that isn't if we haven't shown that offline we're showing that on egf and uh, i think we're, we're feeling very good for the rest of the season especially now that we're up two matches and you know we can feel a bit more confident going forward yeah I mean, I'm glad you're like getting a wide variety of Smash experiences. And since you have been, been able to get to know the team a little better this year, this is something I kind of like to ask people. Um, there are a lot of players on St. John's. There's uh, no doubt about that. So in your opinion, are there any like hidden bosses who you feel like maybe offline they're a little better or they just haven't gotten the chance to show how good they are yet in egf like ha anyone like that yeah uh we have a teammate no mill he uh he hasn't been able to come onto the you know the, the main roster for egf but i'm sure if we had him in a match he'd definitely kick some butt uh, i'm sure he'd do super well if, if we if we put him in that's that's a hidden boss for sure i think everyone else we've pretty much put in already and i think you we, we've shown what they can do so He's just the last one. We're, we're kind of keeping him hidden away. And uh, you may, maybe you'll see him soon. Who knows? Yeah, we'll keep our eyes out. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, now, as you head on to next week, there's only two more weeks left of uh, this uh, split of the season before we take a, 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 a winter break intermission. And you guys continue your your run through the mac next week you get manhattan how do you prepare for this kind of mac run that you guys are going on um i think we just want to maintain the mentality that we've had going into today and hopefully you know bring it back to next week some of us have uh, been feeling pretty strong or at least you know um very motivated to to get better and to you know like just like play our hearts out and i feel like if we can keep that going continue practicing throughout the rest of the week you know get still get like more used to online and the in the trials and tribulations that come with that i feel like we can we can you know take the the next week's match hopefully just as decidedly obviously you know we, we don't know our opponents i don't want to un underestimate them but we're hoping to you know push that and and get that win next week very strongly i'd say well, based on the performance you had today, I can't say I'm too worried, but I'm glad you're taking it seriously. But for now, congrats on the win once again, and thank you for your time, Playmaker. <laughs> thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Of course, of course. Always happy to highlight some good players. But for now, that's all the highlighting we got. We're going to go for a, well, decently sized break. But when we return, we will have the last game of the night. This has been Kilo Miles and Soy signing off for now, but we will be back later. <laughs>